Welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. Here to usher you into what's going on in Missoula, around the world, and beyond. Uh, we talk about things that's happening within the city. I have my city council report. I talk about movies that are coming up this weekend, in which you can pass. So let's kick things off. Uh, of course, over the last week or so, uh, the, the, one of the major headlines have been Ukraine, Olympics, and Joe Rogan. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, be, it's been kind of crazy just with everything that's been going on. You know, you always hear stories about this and that. And I literally just read an article um, on NPR saying that uh, a, Russia, a Russia skater was basically uh, disqualified for a use of a certain kind of heart medication which is considered banned in the Olympics. So there's definitely a kind of a, a lot of interesting things going on and a lot of like predictable things going on in a way. But in lighter news, uh, we had a kind of a Hollywood type uh, visit Missoula uh, during a uh, screening last weekend of the film Miracle Valley, which starred uh, Greg Sestero from the uh, infamous uh, cult movie The Room and the writer of The Disaster Artist which you know that uh, went on to uh, win uh, numerous awards at the Oscars for the uh, uh, portrayal of Tommy Wiseau and Greg Sestero's journey in creating their own cult movie. So good times were had by all. Um, you know who's not having a good time? Canada. Uh, of course you know uh, they had a parliament uh, uh, session this week as well to kind of basically uh, chastised the uh, liberal side, including uh, the government with uh, 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 Prime Minister Trudeau. Ottawa truckers are ca ca caused quite a stir in Canada over the last couple of weeks, and so, many, so much that Kickstarter that raised more than $11 million has been frozen by request of the Canadian government in a state of emergency. Never thought the right to drive through Canada unvaccinated was such a deal. Doesn't that undermine the fact that those vaccinated would be fine? However, Canada laws regarding COVID uh, doesn't mean jack to the truckers using the roads to drive through Canada. The police have been on standby and frankly have been outnumbered not only by the truckers but by local Canadians who also uh, are in support of, uh, support of this movement to voice their concerns from an overreaching government. Of course, close to a thousand protesters and uh, tractor trailers and larger vehicles have been running their engines and honking their horns day and night since descending into the city last month. Uh, in terms of the U.S., it seems that we're actually in the process of possibly removing the mask mandate. Uh, in a stir of stories between Illinois, New York, and even Nevada, um, you know, Vegas removing mask mandates in their casinos, and New York uh, is removing a lot of their uh, masks in indoor settings. Uh, uh, the White House says that there are underway about, uh, about how and when to move the country out of the emergency phase of the pandemic. But in the meantime, people are still advised to follow the following guidance from the U U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, recommending mask use indoor settings in places of high transmission rate. So basically, if you're in a, if you're in a room with a bunch of people and there's like a bunch of people that you're, you feel like you're cla being basically claustrophobic, maybe that might be a good time to wear a mask. Who knows? I don't know. World Health Organization saw a 50% drop in cases in the United States and 70% around the world. With weather getting warmer and spring coming along, if trends continue, numbers will par probably start seeing record lows. However, like I said, the CDC will, will continue to stress the importance of mitigating spread throughout the community. Um, Missoula's $13 million build grant bill, better utilizing investment in the, to leverage development, is officially moving forward, and in the Mullen area thing is now going to start building on that 54 acres uh, uh, and beyond with the connectivity of the roads. The money received Tuesday, which is the $13 million, uh, will fund two roundabouts at key intersections on Mullen Road and will extend George Elmer Drive to England Boulevard. It will also extend England Boulevard to Flynn Lane and will connect to Mary Jane Avenue uh, north to Broadway. So the whole idea is it's going to be a big connect way, uh, really opening uh, a lot of uh, uh, roads up. Flynn Lane used to be kind of like the back road for a lot of people to take and it would pass right in front of a school district. So a lot of uh, families, and especially the new families in the area, are definitely worried about the, uh, the, the pretty large jump in population uh, and the attendance of the school is definitely going to boom and be impacted by the amount of houses that are going to be built. Homes, eventually, but expect this to be one of the biggest residential developments in Missoula to date. And uh, I actually have a picture for you guys I want to show you, and it is from kind of like the satellite view and this is kind of like the draft of what they uh, kind of want to do with this particular thing and it is as you can see this is basically going to connect and spread housing stock for about 
four to five neighborhoods that are either expanding or being created. This area will be um, in the county, kind of like Airport Boulevard, which means that at some point it may get annexed uh, according to most kind of like growing city trends. There'll be a five walkable community centers with a blend of retail, commercial, and office space. It had, uh, identifies six miles of new trails, the restoration of Grant Creek, and a 40-acre acre urban farm. The entire area covers about 1,800 acres in total. Uh, of course, uh, one of the other news items around town as well is that the nine acres on the other side of Scott, on the other side of town off Scott Street are also working through the permitting phase, which uh, I've seen the designs and a lot of the things like that. And they're trying to uh, emphasize more on uh, community spaces and uh, gardens and parks and stuff like that. And according to the project partners, this would mean the price range from roughly $250,000 for a studio or small one-bedroom condo to $450,000 for a large four-bedroom townhouse on three levels. The project will provide a blend of housing types within the three-acre land trust. Um, the unit should be available by late 2023. 20, early 2024. The project also includes an additional six acres that includes market rate departments and other amenities, including the 20,000 square feet in retail space. So this is a city-owned uh, portion of the north side, and so they're moving forward with uh, ability to with affordable housing. But it, according to certain trends uh, of, in terms of like housing costs, it seems like even the bottom it has to be risen up as well. And most of the people are not seeing their wages increase while at the same time cost of living increasing. So affordable housing is going up in terms of qualifications. So it's going to be very interesting how it's going to be uh, kind of implemented, especially in like 2023 and 2024. Who knows what's going to happen in those years? Maybe we might, our housing will be just like crash after that, but you just never know. It's, it's all in the future. And right now there's development being made. So they're in the process of going through the permitting process. But for now, I will leave you with an art clip featuring the new exhibit within and without by uh, Romy Duckard. So without further ado, here's this, and I'll be right back after this. Hey guys, welcome back. And so that was kind of like a, 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 some of the art that's featured at the Museum Art Museum. I suggest you check it out. There's a lot of great uh, new works there as well. I have another art clip for you later in the show, uh, showcasing another art exhibit that's going to be ending uh, this month. So, and it's really cool. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you guys uh, it later in the show. So let's kick things off with some uh, pre-critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing, but maybe the poster and maybe a little bit of synopsis. But I already have my prejudices as against a period piece, a uh, crime mystery on um, the Nile. So it's going to be in Egypt. Um, it's uh, going to be a very interesting kind of movie. It's called Death on the Nile. Well, we won't be in denial, but we can watch a movie about uh, it. Uh, so anyways, murder mystery, the period piece is pretty much a Victorian area featuring a colorful cast of suspects in a continued adventures of French Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, uh, which appeared 
in the previous film, uh, movie, uh, Murder on the Orient Express. So if you remember that, looks like the same guy who directed the first one, Kenneth Branagh, is going to be moving on to this next one. Uh, expect twists, turns, and plenty of fun times to be had until we find the killer and then move on with our lives. Because mis uh, mystery movies are really kind of hard to... Uh, uh, justify rewatching because you watch it and you find out what really happened and you're just like well i if i watch it again i'm not gonna kind of get it but you know there's some movies knives out that are very good about uh, uh kind of like sus uh, suspending disbelief and being like hey this is everything that you know but there's still more to the story than what you know because they spoil the the how the person dies within the first 20 minutes of knives out and then they just keep going it's ridiculous Anyways, as much as I like to talk about good movies, let's move on to the next bad one. Marry Me. If the song of By Train with the high-pitched Marry Me, cough, cough. Anyways, uh, Jennifer Lopez, gross, Owen Wilson, wow. And a pr uh, premise about a pop star wanting to get with a non-hip pop artist, but for a polo dad type in a film about love across social classes. It's kind of like that Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks, Seattle movie, Sleepless or whatever, uh, about a kid who gets their dad a wife uh, candidate to kick off the courting process so the kid can go do whatever. Uh, anyways, cute kids, romance movies uh, where the main character doesn't die is a nice breath of fresh air. Up next, we got one of those, um, ooh, geez, one of those dime a dozen. Um, sorry, my audio is really acting up. Just that I'm really popping it. But... Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I don't remember why uh, uh, I called it again. Liam Neeson, Liam Neeson is back again, again, with a movie about a badass fighting his way to a boss, the Old Man X Star Award. Blacklight follows a man who works with Black Ops, so he has like the shady past to school for this, but the government, he's sworn to decide to protect, disregard U.S. citizens. So the, the whole idea is, is like, oh, the government's bad, so the ultimate good who quit the thing that was corrupt is now coming back to do the thing and win the day and all that stuff. All right. Then there's another string of movies that are coming out this weekend, so I'm going to try to get through them as fast as possible. Here is the speed round of Free Critic. Uh, in the in between, Joy King, the romance streaming gal pal in movies, joins the Paramount streaming service for a romance about a post-death relationship goals to reconnect a dead love. Up next, we got I Want You Back. Sounds like quite an intense film, but by judging by the poster, comedic actors will each use each other to make themselves better couples than their exes. The best revenge is a life well lived. Good luck with that. Up next, we also have Final Super Cool. Something I would like to say about this movie, but uh, basically it would be a little bit um, premature. Uh, Wei Yin's family member is in it, so that could be good. Uh, teenager wishes to be super cool and utilizes his 15 minutes of fame and keeps on bashing the snooze alarm uh, only, to get with, only to try to impress the crush, only to get the girl next door. Those kind of typical kind of high school movies that people are so used to these days. But here's another movie that you might be used to. It is a new uh, edition of Dub and Stuff from the 1939 movie, The Gorilla. And when I come back, we have an uh, action pack. Oh, I just don't feel safe from all these cosplayers. They're just rough and tough and... Whoa! Oh, is that thunder? Lightning? Or just a radio that ad. That was WNDC, uh, the Thunder radio station. Oh, Only just playing Thunder. All right, boys, I got an idea. We turn off that radio station. Uh, but how are we going to turn off the radio, sir? Quiet. I know exactly what I'm doing. Come on, guys. But the radio is back there in that other room. Whoa, slow down. How dare you tell me to slow down? Cosh players have this building surrounded. Well, that's it. I'm out of here. Well, let me know if one of them is waifu material. See uh, you later. Now, we'll just wait a second, guys. You can't just leave. What about you, ma'am? You know the ins and outs of this place. Mm, I guess Maybe you so. can help me uh, find uh, traps for these uh, uh, cosplayers. Um, what is that with maybe you? that we could, uh, you know, um, hey, I don't listen, know. Listen, this is very serious for me. I Oh, I, that's I why I'm here, to protect you. I am the best in the business, ma'am. I know exactly the ins and outs of uh, cosplayers, and I know exactly what to do with them. They often oversweat, seek places that are much cooler. Oh, you have an encyclopedia of all knowledge? <laughs> you know these are outdated every five years. Uh, let's see what's in here. Ah, spooky scary skeleton! This is scary! Whoa, maybe not so... Oh, jeez. Huh. Oh! Oh. <laughs> oh, man. That hurt. Oh. Oh, jeez. Whoa, whoa. Oh, man. 
Uh, see ya. Oh! Oh, jeez! Are you okay? Um, secret door, secret door of run. Uh, oh no! Oh, 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 I'm noises. sorry I played with Peter things. Gabriel's oh, 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 Chuck the Monkey. Oh, oh, oh. No, please. Oh, that sounds more like a dog, but still. Uh, oh, don't oh, look in the eye oh, of the gorilla. Oh, oh. I can't stop yeah. looking. They're so beautiful. I'm probably uh, made out of real oh. gorilla. Ah. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> you might be wondering how I got here. Well, <laughs> let me tell you the real story. Hey guys, we're back. And now we're going to talk a little bit about um, your city council kicking things off. Um, one of the things that, uh, the major things they're talking about is the emergency winter shelter has be, been going on strong the last couple months, but recently needed some updates for uh, mechanical renovations at the emergency winter shelter located at 1919 North Avenue West, with an estimated cost around $32,234. It passed. Um, another part of the uh, city council as well as so like electronic bids were opened for January 13th. A single bid was received, and the bid uh, was reviewed for the uh, completeness and accuracy of the deemed uh, responsive. Knife River Corporation was the apparent lowest bidder with a total of $342,000. And so this one is a uh, fair uh, value with MDT construction. And, and so far, these are the many of the water main replacements that are going to be happening throughout Missoula. There's another water main replacement totaling about a million dollars, another one more for more than $200,000 on another main replacement. Uh, one of the big things that they wanted to push for this upcoming year was the uh, usage of, of money and assets moving towards uh, having, of course, you know, that they raise their rates on the water bill, you know, just uh, talking frankly. Uh, and part of that is that, because uh, last year they were able to replace about 0.4% of water mains throughout the city of Missoula's uh, water infrastructure. And so uh, their goal this year is to get up to 0.6%, but in a perfect world, they want to be able to replace a pipe uh, one percent a year for the next hundred years. So that it's a long-range plan within the city to make have this moving forward. And now they're putting some more money behind it to make this a possibility. Many of those were uh, on the consent agenda, but one item uh, Daniel Carlina pointed out reflects Bally, who uh, Missoula hires for police training. So kicking things off is Daniel Carlino. There's a video of Dave Grossman uh, with millions of views and many news articles about Dave Grossman's uh, police uh, 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 trainings for police officers. Uh, because uh, Dave Gross Grossman um, glorifies uh, police violence and killing in the trainings that he gives to police officers. And there's a video going around with millions of views about that. Um, and in 2019, the city of Minneapolis actually banned uh, fear-based training, re referencing Dave Grossman's Killology training seminars. Um, and then after Minneapolis banned his trainings, um, the state of Minnesota passed a law to also ban uh, trainings like Dave Grossman's. Um, and I'm bringing this up because I believe the Missoula Police Department and our city uh, don't want someone who is glorifying uh, police violence and killings to be the same person who was training our police. All right. So that was Dan Daniel Carlino uh, voices his concern about uh, practices in terms of killology. And so Killology just did a little bit more background in terms of this. And uh, Killology has its own website.com. It is not apologetic when it comes to militarizing the police force. It's like there's a lot of books putting the mindset to basically be like, you know, the whole idea is the reaction time for police officers to kill. And they're trying to uh, improve that in a way. So Killology.com, you can look it up yourself. It's very interesting because there's also been some stories kind of going around and one of the things that during these meetings is that uh, um, some of the content is not appropriate. And one of the uh, quotes that uh, I heard from this article uh, was in terms of the best sex you'll ever have is after your first kill. So that's a very interesting kind of a, a dynamic in which uh, uh, was brought up by Daniel Carlino. But I just wanted to let you know that uh, the term killology should be a red flag to begin with. All right, in terms of kind of what's happening within the city, we're moving on to public comment. Um, Matt Larson has a gripe with the city of Missoula, and in this particular case, it's about pedestrian crossings. This is what he had to say. I think we need to add uh, more lighting and flashing lights at certain crossings. Um, you know, Johnson and South Avenue is one where there's a lot, a lot of activity. 
um, any, anything on Russell and the bike trail, um, those are all very dangerous crossings. And, you know, over by the TNC and good food store, I think there needs to be appropriate crossings over there too with lighting. Um, it's just a conducive of a walkable, you know, bikeable Missoula and everyone's safe. Yep. And so that kind of reminds me of, you know, a couple of the other gripes that I have personally with, you know, just in terms of like sidewalk crossings, safety, um, you know, spruce. I mean, even the closer to the downtown, like downtown, if you're going off Higgins, there's easy ways to cross. But as soon as you go a block further up either direction, the crossings get a little more tricky. So you definitely have to like walk out almost half the way past to the intersection just so the cars can see you just the way that the parking is formatted. So there's definitely a lot of things that needs to be done, but the, the, it does bring up a good point, and I just uh, definitely got triggered from there. But anyways, uh, one of the things that are also happening is the Missoula Redevelopment Agency is in the get, getting uh, $2,183,338 $2, from two, 2021, and this was approved by the uh, the 2022 fiscal year budget, and this is an item to reflect an increase of about $80,000 from the original. Um, this will probably be the most uh, discussed item in this particular meeting, and da Daniel Carlino that thinks that some of this money should be uh, on the Marriott and not be uh, covered by the city. So this is what Daniel Carlino says, is that this, the, and, the, and, and MRA, Missouri Development Agency, are the ones that do the TIF funding for a lot of organizations to leverage uh, designs and affordable housing like that so here's daniel carlino um and i understand that 600 roughly six hundred fifty thousand of those dollar of those tip funds were used for the right of way and the utility relocation which i agree are uh, benefits to the community as a whole um, but however i believe that marriott should be paying for their fair share of the sidewalks and the utility relocation um, i'm also concerned about the 1.2 million dollars of tip funds there that the mra paid the marriott for deconstruction and remediation um, I agree that deconstruction should become this, or I think deconstruction should become the standard uh, requirement um, since it is necessary to meet our city's uh, waste reduction goals. And many other cities in the U.S. already require deconstruction on all buildings that were built before 1945. Um, and I think we should also require the Marriott to pay for it themselves. All right. So um, a big swing by Daniel Carlino to basically have the, uh, um, the companies pay a lot of that stuff. Um, in terms of the Marriott and the TIF funding, there was a lot of TIF money, of TIF money that was used to uh, leverage that particular area to make it uh, something that was very unique to the downtown Missoula area. Um, as the continuation moved forward, you know, the uh, Marriott also extended over into what was known as the old Firestone building, and that was basically just like right next door to it. And part of that was, um, uh, I mean, this is also reflects the not only the Merck section of the Marriott, but the additional um, so the city chose to pass this since it was part of the 2022 budget and their subsequent update to finalize the budget in regards to MRA. They can't do anything about this current agreement, but they can change policy to reflect that deconstruction that Daniel Carlino mentioned. Uh, and this said it would have to be a referral according to Mayor John Ng in, in the uh, response comments. I didn't want to show it because it was basically just him just saying you could just make a referral and then he moved on. All right, so there, that kind of completes the city council. There wasn't much going on there. It was a pretty short city council meeting, but they did get really into the weeds in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, about cannabis stores in the city of Missoula. So we're going to talk about uh, about how energy consumption is going to be done within the city of Missoula. But before we do jump into that, one of the big things is that the city wants to move into the new post office building. And during admin and finances, it focuses on the interlocal agreement between the city of Missoula and the county of Missoula. Two different governing bodies are going to be living together. And, you know, the last couple of years, maybe the decade or so, uh, the city and county have been fairly, pretty widely separated. But in these last couple of years, I've noticed that there's been quite a marriage between city and county. So uh, us moving in together at this time seems like it's a good idea. But Missoula has uh, the main post office off of Brook and covers many mailings throughout the western Montana. It isn't the central post office because that's further down on Brook Street. Um, this would be bought for a dollar essentially because it is a government federal building and it'd be uh, the money would be going to and the money that uh the city essentially would be saving uh okay so we're, we'll talk about money in a, in a bit so without further ado here's john adams the city strategic project administrator he talks about uh the site and a little bit of background on this as well so here's john city and the county will acquire the federal building or it goes to auction 
We've agreed to pursue joint ownership with Missoula County. We'll split the building 50-50. We'll split the costs 50-50. Still working on how we'll jointly own and manage the building, what that mechanism will be. Uh, rehabilitation of the federal building will cost less than or the same as alternative space solutions. It would ultimately house the entire uh, county administrative center and the city downtown campus, except the Missoula Police Department. And under current timelines, we would be starting to occupy the building in fall of 2024, but that depends on when GSA transfers title of the building to us. All right, so one of the big things that uh, that he uh, John also mentions is that uh, 2024 would be the acquisition date, but be aware of rehabilitation to the building to reflect current needs and technology, update asbestos cleaning, and will be funded through uh, general funds split between city and county. And so far, they've been floating around the $20 million ticket price would be invested into this particular building. John Adams talks more about funding just in general. As you can see on this slide, the city's population has nearly tripled since City Hall was built. And in a little over a decade, it will have doubled since City Hall's last expansion. So as the city increases in population and extent, the demand for government services also increases. We have more building permit requests, more streets to plow, uh, more need for social services, and more, more people in court. So it's no surprise that we need more employees and more space to provide public service to a city of 75,000 than we do to a city of 30,000 or 43,000. So at this point, doing nothing is not an option. We've outgrown City Hall. We have some alternatives to pick from, but there isn't an option that doesn't require additional space and additional money. So in June, we'd had a and &E Design help us ballpark the cost of some of the alternatives that we saw available to us. And you can see here that the estimated cost of those options that either building new or expanding City Hall are the most expensive options. Okay, as you can see here, you know, just a kind of an overview, city cost through 2024, well, you know, the, the leasing. Uh, so far, the city actually leases their building off of city, where their current location is off of uh, uh, Ryman Street, which is close to the courthouse. Uh, you know, renovation, expand of City Hall would cost more money. Re re rehabilitation of the Missoula Federal Building. Hey, you got the bones there. They just want to improve the insides to make it reflect and also preserve an old historic federal building. And um, let me go back to my notes just so I can get back on track. Uh, some of the questions, right, oh wait, wait, hold on. Some of the uh, questions raised by the inter intergovernment agreement is how are they gonna get along? Just because they're sharing the costs down the middle, are they gonna basically divide the room that divide the building down the middle where they have tape or just county and city side, kind of like a sitcom. But regardless of that, uh, no, they, they have worked it out. There's a, a common space in which both of them will be using. They're still gonna be working out some of the details in terms of that, but also, just so you know, it used to be a post office. Um, current uh, space in the annex building um, just uh, east of it is for the US Forest Service. So the city and the county will put in uh, up to $615,000 uh, together um, uh, for A&E Design to come up with the rehabilitation plan organized by three reps, uh, both representing city and county working together for the proposal. And here is, once again, is John Adams uh, talking a little bit more about the design. And this work will basically take us through design of the building up to construction drawings and permitting. A&E will work with us to identify the needs of every department, desirable adjacencies, County and city, configuration of workstations, number of meeting rooms, size of council chambers, data infrastructure, sustainability, access, security, phasing of construction and move in, order of cost magnitude estimates for each proposed construction phase. It'd be the guiding plan for how the whole project will play out over multiple years and phases. So we're still working on the exact timing of when we would start this work because we don't want to get it too far out in front of a solid date of transfer from GSA, but at heart, this is what's next, and we want council to know that this is how the project team envisions moving forward. Okay. I mean, otherwise, this building, uh, you know, it would be up to the private sector to decide what they want to do with the building. And most likely, if the uh, private sector were to get their hands on this building, they would end up tearing down the post office. I mean, of course, I'm just generally speaking, I'm not necessarily saying of what could be, but the whole idea is that since this is part of the federal uh, building stock, they're able to uh, basically. Um, I give dibs to uh, city and government bodies, local government bodies to uh, take advantage and be able to utilize some of these uh, structures that were built. And the architecture is just beautiful, honestly. And so far, most of the questions from staff and our uh, chances to, of, of the, wait, wait, 
my so far th most of the mm, geez, my grammar is terrible. I got to work on that. Of course, <laughs> the uh, county uh, city streams uh, within joint spaces like meeting rooms. There are splits between admin from both sides to be separate but equal in some ways. One of the biggest concerns was like the data because you know the way that they uh, uh, you know get information, all everything like that. They are completely two separate separate uh, governing bodies of between the county and the city, even though like, you know, of course, you know, the county, you know, the city is within the purview of the county because it kind of encompasses everything, but the county takes care of most of the stuff on the outside of the city limit. But at the same time, there's, there's not much, there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for uh, crossing, but for the most part, uh, the county and city have been fairly separate. Um, let's see, and looking back, the city and county have mostly just kind of kept to themselves and only worked together when they had to. Um, but like I said earlier in this particular segment is that the city and county are closer than they have been in a long time. And so moving forward with this is, is interesting. So we're going to be hearing a lot more from John Adams as we're getting further and further down the line. But uh, overall, 2024 seems to be kind of like the year for, you know, kind of like transitions and development and things moving forward. Um, but for right now, everything's kind of like sitting tight and dealing with the, uh, the fallout from this pandemic and trying to increase the housing stock. but also. Uh, help the government find a place for them to kind of have a permanent home rather than their consistent renting, which as a result would be just just as expensive as not more so as, you know, rental costs increase because the city is not subject to uh, certain alleviated break in terms of payment. So, yeah. so anyways, um, let's talk about uh, the revocation of a resolution 8149. It's uh, known as the Betty's Fund. And so this is a, actually a goodwill fund that was created within the city of Missoula to see if anybody uh, in the city of Missoula wanted to donate money to help people in tax relief. And so far, it didn't really work out. The, uh, the marketing, the, uh, they just kind of like uh, the whole idea of basically being like, hey, this exists, this is here for you guys within the city of Missoula. But then again, it's even more complicated because in the end, they just end up throwing people over to the state the Montana.gov, and I'll talk a little bit more about that after Gwen Jones talks about Betty's Fund. It's really an interesting topic to discuss because I think the good messaging opportunity here is to discuss the property tax relief programs that the state of Montana has, and that's where we should be directing people. Um, also, it, it begs the question of tax reform, which I have talked about for the last six years plus I've been on council, and until we have a more diverse tax base, we're gonna have property tax issues. And I have talked to the legislature, I've talked to constituents about it. Until there is some thoughtful tax reform, we're on a bad trajectory. Um, and I do not think that the initiative 121 that uh, could potentially be on the ballot in November will help. It will cause a huge amount of problems. Happy to discuss that with anyone, but uh, California passed their Prop 13 and they have spent decades dealing with the unintended consequences in NESPEC. Okay, so what she was referring to is, you know, other mechanisms with taxes and uh, tax relief. If you're interested and in, uh, want to know more about the Betty Fund raise, um, you can go to the state website at uh, Montana or Google tax relief for your state. Uh, make sure it's under uh, Montana.gov, otherwise it could be an error scam. So you never know. Uh, so you always got to be careful with those kind of stuff, of course. Um, one of the things that she also brought up was the uh, the aforementioned um, bill passage for uh, 121, which, you know, in layman's terms, you know, they uh, Mike Nugent talked about it a couple weeks ago. I'm going to give you a kind of a brief description of it. It basically puts a 2% cap on property uh, tax increases every year. So if the city or any community wanted to increase taxes to reflect the community need, it would be capped at 2%. And it, there's also a lot of scrutiny in terms of how it would be done to uh, kind of prevent any kind of major uh, height, heights. And so a lot of ways it kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it's being really pushed hard on the Montana legislature. A lot of Missoulians, a lot of people in the Missoula government are like completely against this. Um, look this up yourself, but this is a, an interesting kind of deal in which uh, look up property taxes Montana and you'll be able to find a little bit more information about this. But then again, um, for those of you who are struggling and, uh, you know, like you're, you're retired, you have a, you're on a fixed income, you don't want to, you're worried about uh, your taxes and that stuff going up, there's tax relief programs with the Montana state level, montana.gov, you can go there, um, you can get help with that and um, get some of your tax relief. 
But you know, just going back to the Betty Fund, um, overall it didn't raise any money. It was just, uh, it, it was great when it was conceived, but the whole idea is it just never really happened because nobody really knew about it or nobody w was willing enough to kind of find out about doing it because this is the first time I've ever actually heard about it. So it's kind of ridiculous just the way that they do something and then nothing happens from it. So whatever. Uh, politics. <laughs> let's, let's, let's jump into uh, cannabis. So one of the big things that are happening in the state of, uh, in the state of Montana is that they are seeing some really big bumps in terms of their tax revenue coming into the 20% uh, taxing of marijuana and cannabis products for recreational use. But of course, during land use and planning to address the mitigation and impacts of high energy consumption and cultivation operations of cannabis grow operations, staff has prepared a white paper detailing staff research and recommendations approaching and regulating how energy consumption by cannabis cultivators in the city of Missoula. Here's Spencer Stark. And he was talking a lot about this uh, leading up into, you know, with the buffer and everything like that. So this is uh, Spencer Stark with the background. This is a common theme that we see across our research uh, when examining West Virginia's attempt to legalize cannabis in the last few years. You see a, uh, a dramatic or significant or notable increase in energy consumption of uh, cannabis cultivation. In addition, this can pose um, some obstacles uh, that may have um, uh, insufficient infrastructure to do so. In 2019, Portland, uh, Oregon experienced blackouts uh, that have been attributed to cannabis culture, the increase in low demand. Uh, compare this to Missoula's uh, existing energy consumption, especially its position as the second highest uh, consuming county within Montana, and um, there is a impetus to examine the impact they have on our community. Okay, so there's definitely a lot of uh, information right there that uh, Spencer was referring to, and so let's talk about uh, you know you're running in a greenhouse 24/7. How can you not have a high energy cost? You know the whole idea is that a lot of cultivation of these plants are grown indoors. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, because, you know, it's not the dispensaries that are doing the grow operations per se, because there are some dispensaries that have their own grow operations for sure. But then there's the major, bigger grower operations that are mostly going to be contributing to those higher costs. But then a lot of times, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting kind of how, how we move forward and just in terms of energy costs. But for those who don't already know, growing operations require more power than your typical manufacturer because it's a temperate control facility in a greenhouse that supplies products for uh, most of Missoula. Your graph is ridiculous on how much cannabis production uses power. It's set up to consume about 2,000 watts of electricity per square meter. So it's 40 times what it takes for the leafy green, like lettuce, to grow indoors. So it's, it's 40 times the amount of consumption of just growing lettuce. So it, just think about that. I had to repeat it. For those, looking, uh, for those looking to look up something fun, you can uh, go to Google and ask how many calories are in uranium. A uh, gram of uranium is roughly 20 billion calories. Enjoy. Uh, Spencer also talks about some of the solutions that they are uh, kind of stressing uh, without uh, having some kind of, um, uh, what's that called, uh, putting on a cap. So this is some of the suggestions he has when uh, cultivating some of these new uh, greenhouses. So again, uh, from this research, we come away with four big ideas. The first is that LEDs are more prevalent for cannabis cultivation as they become more effective, and more available for cultivators. Uh, second is that LED lights are uh, more efficient than traditional light lighting technologies such as HID lights or high intense discharge lights. And um, switching to more efficient lighting is the most available and effective way to reduce energy. And finally, uh, the LED costs are at a point where the upfront cost is still high, payback is the energy saving. Um, correlates to a really important um, return on investment. Cool. So a lot of that um, is going to be moved uh, going towards uh, you know energy uh, savings and stuff like that. Um, other requirements, other states are doing limited water use for metric square feet, and measurements are not watched by the city, just reports from users and providers. There is no local energy consumption board in the city of Missoula. Um, 
Madsen Matthew, uh, Matthias uh, talks about the odor issue. So she's also with it within the presentation and some of the things that are being done to help mitigate some of the odor from these growing operations. Um, outdoor odor complaints related to cannabis cultivation have been reported in Missoula and frequently occur in other places that have legalized recreational cannabis. This is a nuisance recognized by staff. Furthermore, staff found that cannabis plants emit volatile organic compounds, VOCs, which, compri or which compromise indoor air quality for workers and are an additional hazard to the subset of the public. Proper installation and maintenance of filtration systems is the most effective method for mitigating odor, mold, and these VOCs. All right. So, um, you know, this is like a, one of the many things that they're going to look into. Uh, you know, the smell, it's not pleasant, and much like beer, it's an acquired taste. The other ways that they're looking into an injury regulation is to use the bare minimum of lighting required and spacing lighting out of lighting out efficiency. So instead of having like three lights, maybe you can have two lights on the same thing and you still have the overall uh, solution. I mean, the, you know, this was a lot of stuff that is kind of floated by staff. There's not really much uh, they can really do about it because ever since legalization kind of moved forward, a lot of things have been just kind of bursting at the seams in terms of just like the consumption and the use and just like, just a bit, there's a lot of money that are just being traded uh, throughout the use as well. So however, regulation from the state law, overseas enforcement, and legal policies may not have any teeth to getting these up to standards that have been introduced that you had just mentioned. Dispensaries, for the most part, don't have major grow operations like I mentioned before. And for those businesses, this uh, meeting didn't really apply to them unless it's closed down grow operations, hence slowing supply. Uh, so far, the city is talking, uh, but nothing much besides encouraging of energy efficient lighting was presented as solutions to this growing energy consumption. So, without further ado, there, uh, if you want to find out more information about city council and more, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website geared towards you know permitting, um, pothole filling up, all sorts of cool things that you guys can do, and also there's a lot of volunteer opportunities as well. Because most people are like, I've talked to some people who come through MCAT all the time and are just like, I want to get involved with politics. It's like, well, you know, like you got to start at the grassroots level, level and start with like local government, volunteer, work in the neighborhood council. Do the kind of jobs that most people don't want to do, but then do something in there that kind of makes recognition and work your way up. And then usually the city council and most communities give you kind of like that bump. And a lot of times... Um, it's, it's definitely effective to move forward with that, but I don't want to talk about <laughs> getting into local politics. Uh, but I will talk about some of the local art because we have another art clip. This is going to be featuring three different artists um, all at the place called, I mean, at the Missoula Art Museum. It's below the bark. It's uh, artwork of, of Jim Frazier, Tim Muzo, and uh, Susie Wolf. And so without further ado, here is a nice uh, montage of a lot of the art that you guys can see at the Missoula Art Museum until the end of this.
Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about events that are happening within uh, the city of Missoula, but we're kicking things off with library stuff. So there's a lot of great library activities happening here at the library. If you want to get involved and get your kids involved with reading, they have Tiny Tales and Story Time at 10.30 a.m. this morning. They also have a bunch of other events, including Yarns and Watercolor at noon on the fourth floor in the, on the Cooper Room and Blackfoot, Blackfoot Board Meeting Room. A lot of in-library stuff. Also, Spectrum Discovery Center always has a lot of fun stuff at the Discovery Bench from about from Wednesday through Saturday, roughly from uh, 10 to about 6 o'clock. You guys can check that out. You can find out more information when you're going on to Missoula Public Library's website for events and more. Um, University of Montana Tax Preparation Assistance is kicking off, uh, actually is continuing. It's going to be at the Gallagher Business Building on the University of Montana campus. This is going to basically be from February 5th through March 12th, and this is from 8.30 a.m. to uh, 2.30 a.m. Uh, 2.30 p.m., sorry about that. Uh, contact the College of Business at the University of Montana for details who is eligible. And this is for individuals who make less than $57,000 per year, which is basically most of us. <laughs> Missoula Indoor Boat Show and Sale, Brett's RV in Marina, Missoula. Hey, they're doing a, a boat show. They're having deals and sales and all that stuff happening at Brett's RV. Uh, basic silversmithing, um, Lifelong Learning Center is a full of a bunch of adult e uh, education type classes. If you're, hey, if, you wanna, if you're missing school, be like, hey, I, I, I went to school. I haven't been to school for like 20 years. This is a, a nice uh, kind of like uh, taste of going back to school. And, you know, they call them non-traditional students. Um, in this one-day class, you'll learn how to cut and pierce a jewelry uh, saw, use hammers to texture metals with stamps, wire, and lace, and create cold connections using rivets and eyelets. You will use these skills to cut designs and sheet metals and basic silversmithing for all your uh, needs and basically sell your wares at the farmer's market. <clears throat> uh, recovery through writing, the Phoenix Museum. So this is a continuation of, you know, the whole idea is like to, uh, to encourage people to uh, quit substances and alcohol abuse is the goal of these workshops to provide a safe, encouraging space to express thoughts and feelings in writing. And so this is a con continuation and they do have recovery through uh, writing and this is at the shack in downtown Missoula. It's at 11 o'clock. This is uh, part of what's called the Phoenix Missoula. And uh, they also have uh, Sunday pickup games at the Shriver Basketball Gym at the University of Montana uh, every Sunday around 5, 6 o'clock. So this is going to be like a month-wide intensive, so you guys can check that out. Uh, Worldwide Cinema Library After Hours. So if you're interested in coming down here at the library, After Hours. Uh, the library usually closes at 6 o'clock, but they have uh, a deal happening tonight starting at 6.30 p.m. So the doors open from... 6.15 to 6.45, so any late arrivals after 6.45 will basically be stuck outside the library. Um, so this is a movie uh, called You Will Die at 20, and it's from Sudan. It's, uh, it's, it's, gonna be, it's an, a, a cool international film. The film starts at 6.30 officially. A late entry is not allowed. Attendees must be entered through the library's parking garage because the library is closed for basic use after 6 p.m. So go to the, the garage. You know, it's basically, you know, there's the parking lot on the other side of the library. You guys can go check that out and more. Um, and this is going to be interesting because there's a, a musical uh, based off of Footloose. It's called Getting to Know Footloose, the musical. It's the, uh, the, the musical version of it, not necessarily the one that already has music in it, but I'm assuming there's going to be singing in it as well. And this can be at the MCT. Their nightly shows are at 7 p.m. at the MCT Center for Performing Arts. And they, are, uh, they have matinees at 2 p.m. on weekends, Saturday and Sunday, and then they have an early evening show around 6.30 p.m. on Sunday. So that's what's happening, uh, Footloose, uh, oh, MCT, Missoula, um, me, uh, mm, Missoula Community Theater is a great way, place for uh, people of Missoula to get together to create, put on a show to perform in front of other Missoula. It's always, it's, it's, a, it's a great and it's a fun time. Uh, Trist, uh, live V-Day Cabaret, Zootown Arts Community Center is doing a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Shows uh, from starry-eyed uh, infatuation to pathetic heartbreak. Um, yeah, that's what it says, pathetic. The struggle of life, love, and relationships are real, folks. The Montana Actors Theater, the team behind the Rocky Horror Picture Show, brings you the fun, uh, flirty, and sometimes frustrated look at modern love. And this is happening. It's $15 for entry fee, and it's at the Zootown Arts Community Center tonight and uh, this weekend as well. So, Blue Shadows, we'll be playing some blues music uh, tonight. Uh, you got... Uh, the debut, a new director's studio. So the University of Montana is putting on their own play. This is the 
play of directors. So this is part of the director's studio at the Massacre Theater, and this is gonna be happening until the Saturday night. So this is happening every, uh, uh, the University of Montana School of Theater and Dance is pleased to announce debut, four short plays featuring an in 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 integral Missoula work of uh, current first year MFA director cohort. Debut runs February 9th through the 12th, 7.30 p.m. And they have a 2 p.m. matinee on uh, Sunday the 13th at the Massacre Theater. So you guys can check that out. Um, also, they're going to have some funk music at Union Club called Uncle Funk, uh, featured at the Union Club. Uh, it could be funny if Uncle Funk uh, didn't actually play funk music. Anyways, Saturday, uh, wrapping things up for my show, you know, Saturday uh, market is uh, and more from 9 to about 1 p.m. University of Montana tax preparation con assistance continues. Uh, they're going to be basically well into March, though. There's plenty of times for that. If you're interested in doing your own show, creating your own television program, MCAT is here to help you with that. And our orientation is Saturday at 10 a.m. And our other orientation is Mondays at 5.30 p.m. for those of you who can't do a Saturday morning. Uh, Heartthrob 5K. So as we're going into the... Uh, Valentine's Day, the, it's the weekend before Valentine's Day, and uh, Heartthrob 5K, this Beat the Weather Doldrums by participating in the Heartthrob 5K fueled by local love. A portion of this year's race proceeds go to the center. The center are, is an open, affirming environment for people of all sexual orientation and gender identity expression. The center fosters safe, inclusive, and welcoming space for community members to focus on identifying development, self-care, empowerment, leadership development, and overall wellness. It is a 5K run and it's gonna be at Silver Park at 10 a.m. All right, teen open studio, so bringing it back, so uh, if you're an artist or you have a teenager who is looking to cultivate some of his art skill, uh, the teen open studio is at the Missoula Art Museum. The classroom at MAMS is stocked with materials for middle and high school students to use for uh, completing art assignments for school or simply to create projects on their own. The MAM staff member and college intern will be on site for each session, no RSVP, it's a drop-in, so this is a drop-in that's happening from 12.30 to about 3. MCAT also has our drop-in for kids. Uh, it's stop animation, media, and other, uh, other video creations that they do, and this is a structured activity from 1 to 3 p.m. The kids are encouraged to kind of come in to MCAT any time after that to work on their own projects, but this is the one where we help them and we have more hands-on being able to cultivate their stop animation stories or their movie-making prowess. So. Valentine's Day Farmers Farm Market at Turner Farms. They're towards the up, up on Third Street towards uh, the mountains. So if you're going down Third Street, Turner Farms is hosting a farm market, their own little farmers market. Uh, Turner Farms at 1 p.m. on Saturday. Hey, it's the Winter Olympics. Why don't we try curling? And the Glacier Ice Rink here in Missoula is doing the Olympic thing, and this is happening at 5 p.m. on Saturday. You want to learn to try it? Sessions start every 30 minutes, beginning at 5 p.m. and running until 8 p.m. A lot of great stuff with that. Uh, Missoula Eagles Sweetheart uh, Dinner is also at the Mi Missoula Eagles Lodge, uh, number 32. Treat your sweetheart to dinner Saturday, February 12th at the Missoula Eagles. This year's Sweetheart Dinner are eight ounce sirloin prawns and sirloin and prawns. All, all dinners include salad bar, garlic toast, baked potato, and dessert. Dinner will be served from 5 to 8 p.m. Please call the Eagles at 543-6346 to pre-order your dinner. Again, that number is 543-6346. And like any other number in the state of Montana, it starts with a 406. So hanging with randos, a night of speed dating. Uh, so this is part of Western Cider. Uh, this is a speed dating at Western Cider's opportunity for mingling old school style. No apps needed to join in, in the fun for a possibility of awkwardness, friendship, and love. So they have speed dating at Western Cider tonight and tomorrow night at 7, uh, I mean, sorry, Saturday night and Sunday night at 7 p.m. at Western Cider. It's uh, one of those places that are downtown. So it's $5 in advance tickets or $10 a day of tickets available at the door. And so the whole point is you pay to sit and talk awkwardly to people across the way and just be about dating. Debut. Like I said, the Universe Montana is the same show as Friday. Um, they're going to be showing those four plays from directors of the MFA program at the university. Sweetheart Skate. So Glacier Ice Rink is uh, doing their uh, Valentine's uh, Skate, and this is from 8 to 10 p.m. on February 12th, Saturday night at 8 p.m. Um, skate rentals and large hot chocolates are $12 per person. You can visit GlacierIceRink.com for more details or to register. Solid Snake Karaoke at Westside Lane Saturday night. You got uh, Russ Nass and the Revelators at the Union Club. DJ Music Chris Moon at, at the Badlander on Saturday. Um, and that's pretty much it for that. I do have a couple things that I have for Sunday just before I wrap up my show, but uh, it's free car seat checkups, um, uh, MESI training center, Missoula Emergency 
Missouri, Missoula Emergency Service has certified car seat installation techniques ready made to make sure your little ones are safe. So if, you, if you have trouble with the car seat, this is a great place to do it. It's from 10 to 2 p.m. anytime. It is located at the MESI Training Center located at 1220 Burlington Avenue in Missoula, Montana. So to drop it. Okay, couples, class, stargazing couples, Canyon with a Twist is doing their thing. Come spread the afternoon with your partner, get your own canvas and your art meals. In the middle, instruction is guided and supplied as I provided. Uh, basketball, like I said, the Phoenix Missoula is doing their basketball at Driver's Gym at 4.30 on Sundays. Children in between, online, Families First Learning Lab. And then finally, hanging with randos, a night of speed dating is continuing on for Western Cider. It seems like the uh, Saturday night is for uh, queer folk, while uh, Sunday night is going to be uh, geared towards straight couples. So that's just letting you know some of the details of that particular thing. So without further ado, that does it for my morning show. I wanted to thank you guys for joining me this morning. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp.